Okay, thank you, Sir, for your time, and thank you for accepting uh, our invitation. And now we will check to uh, the next speaker. Next speaker is uh, Professor Nader Dehdala, Associate Professor of Neurological Surgery, Director of Neurological Surgery Residency Training Program, Department of Neurological Surgery, Northwestern U University, Finberg School of Medicine. Thank you so much for this Thank introduction, you. and uh, I'm really honored to be speaking uh, this morning or this evening, depending where you are in the world, uh, amongst my superstar colleagues and panelists. Uh, let me share my uh, uh, screen. Let's take a peek here. And can you see my screen uh, clearly? Yes, Nader, it is clear. Thank you so much. And uh, again, thank you for including me this morning and this beautiful uh, day of uh, education. Uh, these are my uh, uh, conflict of interest, none of which are uh, relevant to this talk. And uh, this talk is really, and the CVG is really dear to my heart uh, as a pathology that, that we treat. And uh, briefly, uh, a review of anatomy here. When we're speaking about the CVJ, the current cervical junction, upper cervical spine, or the occipital cervical junction, we're talking about two joints three bones, the occiput C1 and C2, and the atlantoaxial joint and occipital, uh, uh, atlanto-occipital joint as well. So these uh, are the uh, vertebrae that constitute C1 and C2. They're very unique in shape and anatomy. And let's not forget that the C2 joint has five synovial uh, surfaces. Um, and uh, paying attention to the anterior one here, just uh, in front of the odontoid as uh, this is a joint that can be also involved in inflammation and progression of rheumatoid arthritis. So the anatomy determines function. So the range of motion and the direction of motion is determined how the joints are oriented. The C1 occiput joint is cup-like in the coronal sagittal plane, allowing for flexion and extension with lateral axial rotation, while the C1 C2 joint, atlanto axial joint, is uh, convex in orientation, allowing for axial rotation about the dense. What stabilizes the CVG are the ligaments. So the joints determine the direction of motion, but the ligaments are the stabilizer of the CVG. And there are many ligaments there. One easy way to remember them going from anterior to posterior, divide them, divide them into four layers. The, four, the first layer contains the atlanto occipital membrane. The second layer contains the alar, epical ligament in the middle and the alar ligaments on the sides, spanning the dense to the medial aspect of the occipital condyles. The third layer constitutes the uh, cruciate ligament with, with its uh, transverse atlantal and superior and inferior cruise components. And the last layer, which is the continuation, continuation of the PLL, are the, is the tectoral membrane. Now, most relevant uh, ligaments that stabilize the CVG are the ALR ligaments, which limit lateral bending axial rotation and the transverse ligament that limits uh, flexion. There's a lot of motion that occurs at the CVJ, occiput primarily flexion extension, while the C1, C2 joint, uh, there's a lot of uh, axial rotation, obviously, as well as flexion extension. And as we alluded to previously, the ALR ligaments acts as a check. Uh, it limits lateral bending and axial rotation. Let's also not forget that most of the cervical lordosis is dictated by the upper cervical spine, mainly C1, C2 less so by the uh, subaxial spine. Um, the CVJ uh, is very uh, fascinating junction because it can be involved in many pathologies and many pathological processes can involve it. Congenital, mainly carry uh, malformations based on invagination, atlas stimulation, osodontoidium, inflammatory, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, infectious, neoplastic, intraextradural, as well as traumatic from occipital cervical dissociations to C1, C2 fractures and combination fractures to uh, atlanto axial rotatory subluxations. To me, when the anatomy or the bony anatomy is simple, where the anatomic relationships are normal between the occiput C1, C1 and C2, the decision to treatment is pretty simple. For instance, cases of KR malformations with free from abnormal bony anatomy 
or occipital uh, atlas simulations. These are easier to treat, intradural tumors, fractures. When the anatomy is disrupted, bony anatomy, when the relationships are disrupted, when you have autofusion, old fractures, basal invagination, uh, cranial settling, clipal file, you got to pay more attention to the pathology uh, such that you can uh, give the patients the best uh, surgical strategy and outcomes. An example on a simple, um, when the anatomy is uh, normal and uh, uh, not disrupted is a KR1 malformation, a tonsillar ectopia causing crowding at the CVJ, just a decompression with or without duroplasty will alleviate the symptoms. This is also another uh, case of where the anatomy is preserved, uh, intradural ventral meningioma, decision-making is simple, dorsal decompression, resection of the tumor, and that's it. Now, it comes tricky when the anatomy is abnormal, like in this situation, this situation, and even this one. This one, you would think that this is just crowding at the uh, foramen magnum uh, due to tonsillar ectopia, but however, there's more to it. There's actually atlantoaxial instability in the setting of atlas assimilation clipal file. An old algorithm that was proposed in the past, uh, uh, looking at these anatomy uh, abnormalities as reducible versus not reducible. If it's reducible through traction, then you stabilize it. If it's irreducible, you look at where the encroachment is or the compression is and address it such that if it's ventral encroachment, you decompress it ventrally and stabilize. If it's dorsal, you decompress it dorsal and stabilize. I'm going to show a few examples on reducible pathologies, and then we'll go over the rest of the algorithm and how it evolved over time such that the ventral encroachment uh, uh, pathologies do not necessarily uh, need to be addressed uh, with ventral approaches. So this is a, uh, an example. I have three examples to show on uh, reducible pathologies. This is a lady with metastatic breast cancer, presents with neck pain, pretty significant, won't be alleviated unless she lays down. Uh, was found to have diffuse metastasis and with the index level being a pathologic fracture of C2 with uh, causing also C1, C2 instability. You can see the subluxation here on the parasagittals. This is a reducible uh, pathology. You can see here there's no compression, but there is a deformity. No pace, pace, you, you, yes, sir. Who is, yes. Yeah. You have a question? Okay, I I will continue. So so this is a reducible pathology. You put a patient in traction, lock them in a vest. You can see that you reestablish the alignment uh, normally um, uh, with reduction of the subluxation. And then you can perform an occipital cervical fusion. And actually, after treatment, the bone reconstituted and the patient survived about uh, four years after the operation. This is another example on a reducible pathology. Uh, this is a patient who, uh, IV drug abuser, who presented with quadriparasis, uh, actually cruciate paralysis that was due to atlantoaxial rotatory subluxation due to extensive destruction of the C1 and C2. Uh, as well as their joints. You can see here that's a, that's a, a sagittal, parasagittal views showing the uh, destruction and the deformity that ensues after the, uh, this, this destructive process. This is an AP or a coronal view showing uh, both the occiput and the sagittal view and the subaxial spine of the coronal view showing that the, this rotatory subluxation, how um, it shows up on these CT scans. And this is due to a retropharyngeal abscess uh, causing destruction of, of the bone. So drastic presentation, patient five, one out of five of the uppers, two out of five of the lowers. What to do with this patient? Uh, the instability is causing the deformity. So place the patient in traction, 15, 20 pounds. You realign the CVJ because it's pretty loose and it's easy, easy to realign. You can see here with realignment, you're decompressing the spine, doesn't become an emergency. It's not an, an emergency anymore. Although it has a deficit immediately, the patient started getting better, regained a lot of his function. And then the next day you can take the patient to the operating room and stabilize him or her. You can see here with traction, how you can re achieve reduction. 
It's a team effort, obviously, awake fiber optic intubation due to the retropharyngeal abscess, the, the airway takes precedence here too. Um, and then you perform the uh, OC fusion. This is another case of reducible pathology. This patient presented with uh, headaches, upper neck pain, in addition to upper and lower extremity weakness, um, absent gag and cough. And you see this, you look at the syrinx and you say, okay, there's crowding at the foramen magnum. Let's just do a decompression, duraplasty, and take care of it. However, if you look closely at the bony anatomy, it's not the crowding at the CVJ that's causing the syrinx. It's actually the instability. You can see here, this is an occipitalized uh, C1, uh, or at, the atlas is assimilated cranially, and then you and then um, uh, the views, the parasagittal views, would show that the patient also has a clipal file. C2 and C3 are autofused, creating a big moment about the atlantoaxial joint. If you do a flexion extension MRI, you can see here there's anterior translation of C1 relative to C2, and it reduces an extension. So the syrinx here is actually due to instability. And the treatment of a decompression duroplasty would probably uh, uh, compromise the patient's symptoms and lead to a worse outcome. So part of the treatment is an, is an stabilization, occipital cervical fusion, in addition to the decompression and duroplasty. Uh, you can see here that the syrinx has improved and uh, the patient's symptoms also nearly resolved, including the headaches. So we showed a few examples on reducible pathologies. Let's uh, talk about uh, the rest of the algorithm. So if you have a ventral encroachment or a retroodontoid um, collection, should we go ventrally? The old algorithm says yes. However, understanding the pathology would lead to different conclusions. So, so classically, ventral pathology, you attack it either through an endoscopic endonasal approach, transoral, or a high, high uh, cervical retropharyngeal approach. That holds true to some pathologists, but not all. Understanding the pathology made us better understand how to um, address ventral pathologies. And then there are efforts that we utilize these days that would obviate ventral decompression, um, including pre-op traction, intraoperative traction and neuromuscular blockade, as well as intraoperative reduction techniques. This is a lady with rheumatoid arthritis who presented with uh, neck pain and also quadriparesis. Uh, and you can see here, she has uh, a retroodontoid a rheumatoid panis. She also has in the subaxial spine uh, um, uh, compression. So understanding the pathology would lead us to not address the pathology anteriorly. So this, the inflammation uh, leads to ligamentous laxity, atlantoaxial subluxation, further inflammation would create a retroodontoid odontoid panis, further instability, and hence uh, compression. So this lady underwent a decompression and OC fusion with resolution of the panis, since the panis is the result of uh, a uh, instability due to the inflammation. Here's another case of CPPD on the left side, patient presented with um, uh, upper extremity weakness. You can see here uh, on the uh, uh, image that there is a retroodontoid collection or uh, panis, probably compatible with CPPD. The treatment is a dorsal decompression and fusion. And then you can see that the CPPD uh, collection would, would resolve. So we gave some examples on understanding the pathology would lead to the appropriate treatment. Let's look at different techniques that would obviate eventual decompression. First one is use of preoperative traction. Here's a patient who um, never had an issue, suffered the fall, and then presented with cruciate paralysis, upper extremity weakness, um, dysphagia, uh, and presented the trauma bay. And you know, this is a CAT scan. It didn't show any fractures. However, it showed a pre-existing congenital problem with, with, with the upper cervical spine or the CVJ. He has both um, cranial settling and also clipal file, autofusion of C2 and C3. And although this condition is congenital, it can progress in adulthood because you have a big lever arm, which is an occipitalized atlas, cranially, cranial to the atlantoaxial joint. And caudally, you have a, another lever arm, which is the uh, autofused C2 to C3. So with time, this would create 
more motion on this flat joint. This joint is almost flat. And these patients can progress in adulthood with uh, further cranial settling and further um, uh, cervical medullary compression. This patient presented to us after a trauma, uh, cruciate paralysis, which is the uh, um, uh, central cord of the upper cervical spine, no fractures, but he definitely had uh, a pre-existing condition that made him prone to becoming uh, neurologically compromised. You can see here, this is the uh, MRI showing uh, signal cord change um, uh, that explained his cruciate paralysis symptoms. So what do we do about this patient? We put the patient in traction and we can realign the cervical, uh, upper cervical spine. You can see here, there the before and after traction. And this is, I think, in my view, enough reduction that does not warrant a ventral decompression. So you put him in traction, lock him in a vest, and uh, then do an OC fusion. With distraction too, there's the opportunity to get, to get into the atlantoaxial joint and fill it with bone graft such that this patient would improve his chances of fusion and also would decrease his chances of resettling. This man had a good outcome. Another technique we utilize are, uh, sometimes is interruptive traction and neuromuscular blockage to loosen the uh, muscles in the upper cervical spine and cervical musculature that can aid in interruptive, interruptive reduction. And uh, we studied that in the past in pediatric patients. I had, we had this patient who is a rare case. She's a, uh, a patient who uh, underwent a um, Chiari decompression elsewhere, uh, reportedly, and then uh, woke up with this cock robin head. Uh, she had a uh, carotid artery dissection causing malignant uh, stroke, requiring a hemicraniectomy, and she also, had, she also had a vertebral artery dissection. So we don't know the mechanism of how this happened. However, I saw her after four months after she was transferred to rehab. She came, uh, I was consulted to see her in rehab, and she has this cock robin head, which is really stiff, would not definitely budge with any uh, traction or any muscle relaxation. And she had the rotatory subluxation, no fractures, but the rotatory subluxation. So this patient would not budge with preoperative traction and uh, you know, an anterior release of the C1 arch going from the front and release the joints is a big endeavor, especially in this situation. Uh, she has one functioning carotid artery and one functioning uh, vertebral artery. So we thought we'd try neuromuscular blockade only watching the SSEPs. Definitely, this is something that is uh, risky. Uh, so we placed her uh, um, under general anesthesia. Uh, we placed her in traction and slowly she started reducing. And then we obtained an interoperative CT that showed that the reduction was adequate. We locked her in a vest just to make sure that her, she's neurologically doing well. And then this is further confirmation of the reduction of the uh, rotatory subluxation. Then we uh, locked her in OC fusion. I, I elected to go to the occiput and do multiple points of fixation just because uh, for better biomechanics in this particular patient, maybe it was an overkill. She had an excellent outcome. Here, uh, I will also end by showing a couple more cases here. Uh, this is a patient, 22-year-old uh, uh, gentleman who presented initially with horizontal nystagmus. Then he was worked up and was found to have uh, uh, significant uh, uh, pathology at the CVJ. Uh, we offered him a treatment, then he was scared, disappeared for two years. He came back with worsening symptoms of gait imbalance, upper and lower extremity, upper extremity weakness, numbness. Uh, <clears throat> on exam, he had weakness in the upper extremities and he had an absent cough and gag reflexes. And also he had brisk reflexes in the uppers and lowers. And this individual definitely, you can see has multiple congenital abnormalities. Uh, you can count many as a flat uh, skull base and uh, as cranial settling, he has uh, uh, crowding at the uh, upper cervical spine and has auto fusion uh, to clipal file. You can see uh, uh, the cranial settling yeah. in this. Is, is that a question or just uh, unmuted? Spe uh, sorry, sorry, it was unmuted, sorry. Okay, no problem. So, uh, so you can see here um, the pathology that explains the patient's symptoms. Uh, 
the atlas simulation, clipple file, cranial settling, crowding at the CVJ. You can see the skull base angle should be less than 143. It's definitely obtuse. The clival canal angle should be less than 150. It's definitely, uh, for, sorry, more than 150. It's definitely much less than that. And classically, these kind of patients would undergo a ventral decompression and then an OC fusion. In this situation, we try to utilize the things that we have in our bag to obviate a ventral decompression and see if that would work. And we utilize preoperative traction and also intraoperative reduction techniques. So we place the patient in traction. That was before traction on the left side, after traction. It improved a little bit uh, in terms of the reduction, but not uh, perfect yet. And then uh, we utilized uh, an intraoperative uh, technique uh, developed initially by uh, Dr. Goel and then uh, by Dr. Walensky and uh, uh, Gokaslan. You can see here with the traction, we improved, the, we reduced a bit the cranial settling and we improved the clival canal angle. And that's the patient here positioned uh, for uh, the posterior OC fusion and intraoperative reduction. So with intraoperative reduction, we're aiming at, uh, with distraction techniques, pushing the odontoid dense caudally and with compression, pushing the dense anteriorly. And key in achieving that is to get into that atlantoaxial joint and release the capsules and get into it and loosen it. So this is, you can, and this way you can maximize the utility of any interruptive reduction technique. So what you do is you decompress, loosen the joint, and then you instrument, you put your occipital plate and then lateral mass screws, or if you have fixation point in C2 and C1, you can certainly do that. And the first step is you put, you contour the rods, make them really longer rods, and you put a C-clamp uh, cranially, and then, and then you keep the uh, 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 lateral mass screws, set screws loose. This way you can distract, pushing the dents caudally. Then you lock in your lateral mass uh, screw heads, uh, set screws, and, and then you, uh, uh, with uh, ventral compression, with, with compression, you move the dents uh, anteriorly. So you can lock in the C-clamp, keep those screws loose. And then, uh, and, and then you, this way with compression, uh, you push the dents anteriorly. And this is a video here demonstrating just part of it. You can see here, see the contour rods are really long. And here we're distracting. You need maybe a centimeter or a centimeter half a distraction. And then do the same on the other side. And then you put your C-clamps and compress them to push the dents uh, anteriorly. And this is the end result. You can definitely, any space you find, you can uh, put a bone graft in there to augment your fusion and uh, improve your fusion rates. And looks this looks better. The patient got better. Definitely the plan would be if if there is still patient symptomatic, then we definitely need to go uh, anteriorly and remove the compression anteriorly, but he, he is doing well. Now let's not forget that definitely ventral, uh, ventral pathology sometimes require anterior approaches. This is a patient with a significant compression of ventrally and uh, uh, causing signal cord change and uh, necessitating an endonasal approach resection. It turns out to be an infection and a st stabilization. Definitely the algorithm is more involved now, understanding the pathologies and using whatever you have in your armamentarium in terms of reduction techniques, pre-op traction, intra-op traction, intra -op use of neuromuscular relaxation uh, to obviate a ventral approach and uh, definitely leaving ventral approaches as, as, a, as a last resort. Uh, one thing I wanna mention here is uh, this is an OC dissociation, a traumatic OC dissociation where all the ligaments are disrupted. This is a patient that you don't wanna put in traction. Although it's a dislocation, traction would definitely worsen the patient's um, condition since this is a significant uh, situation of instability where all the ligaments are torn front and back. So although it's a dislocation, this patient needs uh, occipital cervical fusion. You can place them in a chronic halo vest, but no traction. That's all I have, and I'm open to questions. Thank you, Sil, for uh, this uh, great presentation. Uh, two questions uh, on chat. First one. Uh, 
thank you thanks to the fruitful uh, lecture my question regarding your experience in csf league after carry the combustion how to manage it if failed tight dual rebuild or dual c so uh i yeah, so I mean, it's it, if it, if the if the leak is symptomatic, leaking through the skin, it's a revision. We go in, open it up, and uh, patch it, and then we can definitely divert, uh, uh, use lumbar drainage to divert uh, CSF so that our closure would would seal. But sometimes, if it's a contained leak and not too symptomatic, we've, uh, for instance, I had a patient who had really not a huge pseudomeningocele, but she had some hygromas. I was able to manage it with uh, Diamox. But certainly, any leak that it's leakage through the skin, CSF through the skin, uh, my hands, I have a low threshold of taking the patient to the operating room, exploring uh, uh, and uh, revising the closure, and then diverting CSF with a lumbar drain. Second question interesting uh, bony reconstruction after RT, four bread mitts, four bread mitts. Would you remove the occipital fixation when this happens? So if I achieve a fusion, would I remove the occipital fixation? Is that the question? Yes. Not necessarily. Mets, mets, uh -huh. If you find mets. Yeah. If uh, the, the case where the bony reconstitution um, after radiation therapy in metastasis for the C2 it was an interesting case. Um, so my question is, uh, if the bone reforms, would you remove the plate uh, to regain so, the motion? So uh, um, that's a great question. I did not do that in this setting um, since the patient had uh, radiation therapy and, you know, uh, concern for wound healing after another revised surgery. I did not do that, but definitely that's interesting because the bone reconstituted and definitely she didn't achieve a fusion, but the bone from within reconstituted, but she did not achieve a, an OC fusion with this. So certainly one can think about it. And my threshold of reoperating in patients with metastasis is very, very high. Um, unless it's really warranted in terms of wound revision, I'll do that. But uh, for just the removal of hardware, uh, I won't do. Plus, I'm not sure if really the atlantoaxial joint is stable enough uh, for me to remove the hardware. Nadir, can I make some comments? Yes, sir, Dr. Gawa. <laughs> yeah, that was a wonderful presentation. And I can see that you are now slowly, surely, but definitely going from decompression to fixation. I can see that. Particularly for carry malformation, you identified atlantoaxial instability and you preferred stabilization. And I'm sure that as you go further in the field of, I can see your work on carry. And I can tell you for sure that as you go further in your experience with Chiari, you will definitely go for fixation in all the cases, even when you don't see atlantoaxial instability on dynamic images. I will recommend that you must see the facets in these cases. And the facets are more often malaligned and even when they are not malaligned, presence of Chiari and presence of searings, as you mentioned, are clear-cut indicators of atlantoaxial instability, and you need to do atlantoaxial stabilization. That is point number one, Nadir. Second point is, you know, you have included in cases of assimilation of atlas and C23 fusion, a number of extra bones which could have been easily avoided, like you included occipital bone and several suboccipital or subaxial segments. I have completely abandoned occipital inclusion of the occipital bone and subaxial spinal segments. The bottom line in these cases is that you have to achieve a very solid C1, C2 fixation. And as you mentioned, we have to open the joint, we have int to introduce bone graft in the joint and then do solid fixation. The other thing that you mentioned and that intrigued me and made me happy was that retroodontoid calcification you identified with atlantoaxial instability and you preferred to do stabilization without touching the retroodontoid tissue. And that is a very important thing that there is, these are secondary 
to Atlanta actual instability and you don't have to actually touch these things that you mentioned, but you still did decompression because you are still afraid of this compression. And as you will mature further into this business, I can tell you for sure that you will find this region so much unstable that there will be no need for decompression in these cases. And I'm sure that you will not do decompression in the future. All in all, a very interesting presentation. Atlanto actual instability is a very common clinical entity. I have said repeatedly that Atlanto actual instability is the most under recognized and under treated clinical entity in the subject of spine. There are so many things we don't understand of, about atlanto actual instability. atlanto actual instability can be present even when the radiology is not showing the instability. So this is a new paradigm shift in the understanding of atlanto actual instability that it can be unstable even when there is no radiological instability. Such instability manifests as a chronic syndrome, chronic instability, relentlessly progressive symptoms, which are so much relentlessly and ultimately disabling symptoms. So we have to understand this issue of instability without radiological demonstration and which will be a new field in the subject of craniovertebral junction. Thank you very much Nader and I wish you all the best and I am sure you will progress further in this business of craniovertebral junction. Thank you so much Dr. Gowal, I'm really honored. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.